Welcome to my show, Confession of a Futurist with Sanjeev Goyal. Every Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. on Radio Zindagi, we invite mavericks, meta-entrepreneurs, and change agents to share their secret of the future. Our today's guest is a very special guest. He's founder of Nitya Capital. He started his investment career by acquiring a, a small four and a half million dollar multi-unit complex. Today, they have more than $2 billion worth of portfolio. Sapnil Agrawal immigrated to US with his parents when he was 15 years old. So before we bring him, I want to talk a little bit about the data. So as per Urban Institute and Harvard EDU, there are some very interesting data set we have around housing. We are expecting a major growth of 65 plus population. And that will create new demands for affordable housing. By 2035, the number of older households with the disability it will increase by 76% to reach 31.2 million. Let's talk to our next guest who has spent more time in real estate and he can help us decipher some of these things and how can we help the next generation. Sapnil, welcome to our show. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. It's an honor to be here at the show today. Thank you. So I have my first question. You know that you're prepared, right? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> All right. Do you have a confession for our audience? Today is your chance. Uh, yes, I, I would say my confession while growing up was that I loved Bollywood movies and I hated to read. Oh. And, <laughs> so, you know, that's why I always have a special place for radios in my heart because, you know, growing up, we didn't have TV for, I would say, the first eight years of my life. So, you know, listening to the, the cricket commentary and, you know, listening to songs and when Chitrahar used to come every Wednesday and Friday. I mean, those oh, you remember special... that time? <laughs> yes, of course, you know. <laughs> so those were special times and uh, I guess you can call it my confession, but it's a confession that I would say many of your viewers would probably share with me as well. <laughs> I'm sure. And we grew up watching black and white uh, Star Trek. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Mr. William Shatner. Yes. So, uh, Sapnal, Post-COVID, we are still in COVID, our world is completely changed. And we are seeing this transformation. And before uh, our call, we briefly chat about how our world is going to be. So if I ask you for a prediction in next two years and next 20 years, what will be that? I would say, because we went through this exercise of living through COVID times, uh, I'd say that the use of technology in our day-to-day -day life, whether it's in personal lives or whether it's in professional lives, I think that has expedited by at least five years in my mind, right? I think whatever we are doing today, like we're having a Zoom call or, you know, we're seeing people sell uh, digital arts by way of calling it NFTs for millions of dollars. I mean, really, at least personally, I would have never expected that to see that within a year. If you were you were disposed, uh, have spoken last during last March in 2020, so I'd say that itself is going to give you a glimpse. I would say next two years itself are going to be phenomenal. Whether you know now you have, I can't even call you know count how many social media platforms you have, right? You have, you know, in the business world, this invention of SPACs where you have, uh, which is the special purpose vehicle where people are basically raising hundreds and millions or billions of dollars for a company that's just in theory on paper. And they have not made a single product, have no profitability, of course. And you're saying millions and billions of dollars being raised for that. Now, do you think if I had taken a business proposal to somebody, last year and say, hey, I need to raise 500 million for this. I don't have a product. I don't have a prototype, but give me 500 million. I think we would all be like, come on, this guy's is lost it. And now you're seeing that as a reality, right? Then you have 
you know, so many companies, tech companies like Airbnb, I, I would say that the way I can summarize the changes we will see is I think the companies, the services companies, whether it's, you know, whether it's for convenience like Amazon or whether it's a social media platform, I think most of the companies are going to put the clients or the, the end user products convenience at the forefront. And what I mean by that is you have, you know, you know, we used to have usual cable TVs, right? Like we we're talking about Chitra used to come once or twice a week. Now you have, you know, when YouTube came, we thought it was going to change the world. Now you have, you know, the Netflix came. Now Netflix, I would say, had 10 plus competitors and Disney plus and, you know, Amazon Prime. You have so many of those platforms. And now the content is being generated or being created to satisfy or keeping in mind that person's convenience. So now no longer we are expected to sit in front of our TV at a certain time and watch certain shows. We, are, we have literally everything at the palm of our hands. People use iPhones. And now even if you think about iPhones, I mean, let's step back, right? I mean, iPhone is not is about 10 years old or if maybe 10 to 11 years old. And if you were to say tell somebody, say in 2007 or eight, that, hey, you're going to have an instrument which is going to you're going to be able to take a picture, listen to music, watch videos, make a phone call, surf Internet on one device. You would probably laugh it off because you used to have Blackberry at that time. And even Blackberry was a pretty big deal at that time. And now it's a pretty common thing. Now you're talking about Tesla coming up with autonomous driving where you don't even have to sit and drive the vehicle. Right. That's going to really change how we think about our lives or convenience and how to be efficient, uh, I would say, in next two years. I think next 20 years, you know, if I take Elon Musk's word, I, I bet we'll all have a home in Mars. I am a big fan of the, his work. Yes. And uh, he is definitely um, a phenomenal person. I really like him for one reason. He could have, he's one of the few, and I call him meta entrepreneur. Yeah. The reason is where you don't take no for an answer. Yeah. And where you take the problems which are bigger than you, which can't be solved, even if you have billions of dollars with the money, can be only solved with passion and conviction. 100%. And he has shown our world, not just with the car, even with the solar. Imagine what he has done. In fact, today I was told there are close to 30% energy is produced uh, through alternative sources. And they are targeting, even pg and is targeting 70% in the next, I believe, 10 or 20 years. Yeah. And that's a game changer. And it's I mean, unbelievable, right? You know, this Elon Musk is one of the founders, people don't know, is founders of PayPal. Yeah. And from that deal, he cashed out $180 million and he took every single penny of the money he made and put it in SpaceX and, 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 uh, and, and Tesla. Fantastic. And he himself didn't have money to buy his own house. Yeah. Right? He rented a place. So that tells you the exact point. He's living, his purpose is much bigger than what he's, uh, what he, you know, people think their purpose is. And again, like I said, that that's a phenomenal quality to have. So next question I have for you, Sapnal, is, is the dream of sustainable housing real? I, you know, I'm an engineer and to me, everything about solving problems. And I'm hearing this slogan for so long that... I do you think in our lifetime we will see really truly sustainable housing? Uh, I don't know, Sanjeev, if we will, but that doesn't stop from people like me to keep trying. And I'll tell you the reason why, because, you know, when, when we immigrated and just like lot, all the immigrants, most of them listening to the show, when they came to this country, you know, for me personally, 1996, you know, I grew up in an affordable housing. And what I mean by affordable housing is, you know, rent used to be $600 a month and I would say that the basic amenities were, were completely lacking. There was no security. We used to have a break-in very quite often in our house. I heard uh, even your yeah. father was held on gunpoint. Yeah, yeah. Time. We used to have a liquor store and, and, you know, like any other businesses of that sort, you know, it was a dangerous place to be in. And now to your question, you know, what is a sustainable housing? For me, if I step back, okay, what do I define sustainable housing? I think for me, I want four walls where I can raise a family, or if I'm alone, single, married, without fear of, of any security lapses, a good community which has basic amenities like a swimming pool, a fitness center, uh, and, 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 you know, essentially commodities and services that people would expect to have a home, 
but they can't afford a home so they live and rent apartments and for me that means is so like for example what we did make to make our uh, apartment sustainable is through our karya cares uh, foundation where every senior of our community gets free meals during uh, throughout the year through our association with interfaith ministries then we are providing you know another big aspect that we will all agree on that america lacks is is their healthcare right i i don't know how many presidents have come and tried and it just doesn't seem to solve it for me as my part as my civic duty we started a free healthcare clinic where any houstonian can go there without insurance because let's face it 80% of our illnesses or sickness can be resolved just through advice and just talking through it because people think it's a much bigger problem it's really not as your fever cough and cold so we are doing that from our side we're giving free meals to every kid on our community we're implementing free english classes so for me it's a wholesome approach you have to take more than just the four walls that you call your apartment it's about the feel of a community where people are together you know i always give that example what i think about community is like when i was growing up in india in that little colony of ours in agra where you know all the neighbors knew each other and they were with each other during you know times of tough times good times so i have that impression imprint in my mind where i want to see that again uh, rather than and it's becoming more and more difficult for the reasons we discussed with technology and phones i mean we take our own kids i mean they're on their ipads and iphones every single minute of the day when they're not doing something else so how to imbibe that personal connection within people how to build that community relationship where people feel part that they belong here because look america is a country of immigrants right america is a country where everybody comes from leaving their countries and families behind friends behind and they're coming to this new country where they're largely unknown and they have a lot of questions basic questions at least we are fortunate we speak english there's people who can't speak english there's so many refugees that live in our communities who we employ because they are legally out, allowed to work but we have this people have this uh, uh, in their mind that oh i don't want to you know refugee with what kind of work but these are great hard working people creating this communities i think i would bring back those memories when i was growing up and i would i would say that i'm sure that you can relate to that as well so uh something i have a theory on that and uh i always talk about that being an engineer to me every single listener of our and you and me we are all engineers because we are solving problem that's what we do every single day so anybody who solves a problem is an engineer yeah. i look at this problem a little more holistically maybe because of my background in civil engineering and applied mechanics i believe our current way of living is not sustainable i believe this suburb concept all this i mean even i live in a suburb here and i have a not a huge house but i have a pretty big house and i personally feel that's not sustainable i remember my trip to hong kong 5 or 6 years ago and i was blown away that one city block has 10000 apartments it's like 50 60 story building i lived in hong kong for 7 years by the way so yeah so that's why i bring, brought it up so i become i think i become really good in connecting the dots and especially in this covid time i realize our biggest problem is we are so especially in america so our density is so low that it is a challenge mm -hmm. and we are putting more burden on the society and the earth we are talking about adding 3 billion more people in lakhs next 30 years i don't believe our current infrastructure can handle that kind of burden unless we start building cities which are different is the model of hong kong completely sustainable no i do see some flaws some problems there because when i talk about these things we have to think completely new modern infrastructure so one thought i have it is can be built because in earlier time all the cities were built next to river or water because water was the most important thing we get electricity with water too so transportation of the cost of water and the electricity is so high that the proximity to these uh infrastructure is very important for city to grow but today if we can build a whole city with zero waste mindset 
to the extent that we have vertical farming built in and it's i know it's a dream right now but if i look and if i think about 2050 and if the earth or human doesn't start building those kind of uh, uh, hyper urbanized kind of infrastructure we have serious problems we are not supposed to waste even a drop of water and i can't do that in a suburb i can do it in a large community i can't do it in a suburb because infrastructure cost is so high for just your house or my house so yeah. Point I'm trying to make it is we have to think it very differently. I think we are just putting the bandage to the system. Oh, we are using sustainable material. We are doing this. We are doing that. It's not enough. We need to think it very differently. We need to build new kind of cities somewhere in the desert now because all I need is sunlight. I yeah. put Tesla solar panels. I have electricity now. Yeah. What else I need? Water. Okay, that we will figure it out. And if I don't waste water. My life is easy. The yeah. problem is the waste. Yeah. Otherwise, I can pretty much get the same water and I can continue to use it for ho hopefully few times. So, yeah, I think Sanjeev, yeah, I would say that it, all of your points are 100% valid. Only thing I would say just to add to that uh, is ultimately, I think capitalism is the single biggest tool that this mankind and that's why America is the greatest country that, that we have ever created. So everything you're saying, I think leave it to capitalism, it will take care of itself. When you have the right profit and profitability being associated with each, each of these projects, I think they will happen. And we saw that if you go and we talk about smart cities, uh, I we don't have enough time. I know you and me can talk about smart cities for hours. Uh, you go to South Korea, they took the marsh and convert into such a beautiful city where they have fiber in every single house, even before we are talking about one gigabits connection, we were just talking and they had it. Yeah. It's completely connected city. It's possible because of vertical living. So it's, it's beautiful someday. I'm sure I'm thinking of writing a paper around it because I think somebody has to take. Yeah. I would say connection. that even more than Hong Kong, I would say Singapore is probably a better example for that. I lived there for three years too. Yeah. <laughs> then you can know. <laughs> So uh, for our listeners, every uh, week I make a recommendation of a book. Instead of a book, I will recommend our listeners to watch a movie or documentary on Netflix called Seize Piracy. Please do share your comment. I want to know and do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you like what you are listening today. So next question for you is what is single most technology going to redefine our future i would say that autonomous driving i mean i would say most immediate which will be released very soon i think i mean that will redefine how we prioritize our time i mean all of a sudden you're traveling three four hours between san fran to san jose or from houston to dallas or driving to work you, i mean the life will change you don't have to sit behind the wheel you can maximize your time you can, I mean, there's this concept about ride share where you can essentially make money where, you know, you drive a car and you put it in a rental pool. And I mean, that blows my mind. I think most immediate, I would say that will really have a big impact on our lives. And I can't even comment on stuff like NFTs being sold for millions of dollars because I started thinking about maybe I should create some digital art and, you know, probably, you know, then doing property management of thousands of apartments and taking care of thousands of families is a much easier way to do something. You're a good looking guy. Who knows? $25 million. Who knows? <laughs> no, Sopdil, that is so true. NFG, uh, Bitcoin, all of these things. I mean, it's a brilliant technology. Don't get me wrong. I really love it. But I have a feeling as uh, we have gone too much into money and we have lost the one most important thing is money should be the byproduct yes. of solving a business problem, solving a right. real community problem, society problem. Exactly. What I'm finding it is people are so much after this. Anyway, 100%, that's, that's 100%, 100%. I mean, that's what uh, this this writer says, I forget his name, this very famous guy, uh, Simon, uh, Simon Sinek. Yeah, he says, you know, you create a business. Why, when you're starting a business as an entrepreneur, what is your purpose of doing so? So like, for example, my purpose is to improve people's living conditions, right? 
I would say majority of the people when they start a business, they're driven by how much money they can make. Profitability, how much money you make, will always come at the end, right? That's just a byproduct, like you said. You need to have a much bigger purpose or a better purpose of why you want to do certain thing. And I think again, capitalism solves solves that because people who start business for really a bigger purpose will end up being much more successful than than people who are just driven by money. So. Uh, Sapna, we're both talking about the same thing. Uh, I have a question for you, which is uh, important, and I just got it from some customers, uh, okay. some of our listeners. What is one thing you will attribute your success to? One thing. Just not giving up ever. Uh, just yeah, just no is never an answer. I'm a solution-driven person than a problem-oriented guy, so. For me, I look at yes, in the moment when the problem I face, I might be consumed by that problem and think this is it. But then I have an ability, and I was maybe born with it. I don't know. I can't take credit for it. Maybe I'm blessed with it by God. Is being able to step back and then how do I take that challenge as an opportunity to do better? And and for me, it's just about never giving up. I mean, till I'm alive, till I have. Till I'm breathing, it's just I will continue to strive and work hard and achieve what I want to achieve. That's so true. In fact, uh, I have a friend uh, named Rudy. There was a movie after him, Rudy. We might have watched. Yes, it. yes, yes. So we always talk about it, and he said the only thing worked in his favor. He says, "I'm just an ordinary guy. There are so many football players like me, yeah. but I never quit." Absolutely. And there is a Hollywood movie. After me, which is a blockbuster, <laughs> and a lot of players grew up watching it. Uh, so, you are absolutely right. Yeah, hundred percent. It's like, uh, and I tell everybody in my team. I said, there's people who work much harder than I do. There's people who are much more smarter than I am. All I'm doing is renting places out for people to live. It's not rocket science. Very simple business. Uh, but you know, as as we, I think a little bit of it is all imbibed in our. When we grow up and we immigrate to America in a way, right? Because that's where a training starts in our mind. You just can't give up because if you give up, this country is not for you. Especially when you're coming from from something like India, you know, in the 80s. I don't know when you came, but for me, in the mid 90s. No, absolutely, Sapnal. I came here in 1999, yeah. and uh, one suitcase and 500 dollars in my pocket. So I'm yeah. so grateful that this country gave me so much, so much opportunities. Absolutely. Uh, any final parting thoughts for our audience? <laughs> no, I mean, look. I uh, first of all, it was. Uh, I wish the show was longer because I feel like we we haven't discussed everything. We're just maybe listeners are thinking this is too heavy of a show. We're talking about a lot of philosophical things about. But on the lighter side, you know, look. Uh, you know, life is about having fun, living each moment, living in the present. I think everyone knows that. We all know that it's just hard to execute and implement in our own individual lives, uh, and you know, radios and, and your show uh, provides a great outlet. Uh, reading another thing, which I'm trying to do more of, which I've been guilty of not doing in the past. So let's talk uh, offline about reading, Sapna. Uh, yeah. I want to end the show now, but sure. uh, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoy talking to you. Thank you.